Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in week 7 of the Ramesh Sunni Balwani Theranos trial. As a reminder, Balwani is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. So last week, the testimony of Daniel Edlin wrapped up. He was the project manager who admitted to running the false tests to VIP on the Edison devices and also to choreographing visits around the Theranos facilities, ensuring that the visitors would see essentially just what Balwani and Holmes wanted them to see. This week, we started off with a new witness, Nimesh Javari. We also heard his testimony in the Holmes trial, which you can see here. Jeff Schenk was up for the prosecution. Now, Nimish was a vice president of Walgreens and had responsibility over the healthcare services part of the business and he'd worked for Walgreens for around 30 years when he left in 2018. He was asked when he first heard of Theranos and we learned that this was in around 2011. Walgreens were actually looking to offer new services at that time and redesign some of their in-store healthcare sections. Theranos and Walgreens entered into a contract or partnership. The basics of the contract were that Walgreens would offer their stores for the rollout of the finger prick tests and create branded wellness centres. Theranos in turn would provide its technology and run the tests in less than an hour. Walgreens in turn provided a 100 million innovation fee for the exclusive right to use the proprietary technology. There was a pilot project. The test sites opened in Palo Alto and Phoenix. What metrics did you measure? Javery was asked patient volumes, and number of venous draws versus the number of finger prick tests. Javery explained that the number of finger prick tests was key because it took trained phlebotomists to undertake a venous draw, whereas a finger prick test doesn't, and as a result, Walgreens would be able to offer cheaper in-house blood tests. The initial pilot expanded, and by October 2014, Walgreens had rolled out the Theranos testing to 40 of its Arizona stores, plus the one in Palo Alto. Javery testified that because 40% of the tests were still being done through venous draws, they couldn't reduce the number of phlebotomists. Were you ever satisfied with the number of tests? Schenk asked. No, said Javery. We were trying to get them to zero, he said. So we had that as a bit of background. How did Balwani tie into all this? Well, we heard it with the next line of questioning when Javery said that he took his concerns to Balwani. And Balwani's excuse for the still high number of Venus draws was essentially that the company was still trying to figure it out based on customer demand. He also said that physicians would sometimes ask for both tests as they wanted to compare the two sets of results. He assured me over time that the percentage would go down, Javery said. When asked why did Walgreens pull out of the contract and shut down its stores, Javery explained that it was after the 2015 Wall Street Journal article had raised doubts over the technology. It highlighted issues that we had not been aware of, Javery said. So at this point, we have what I would say is incontrovertible evidence that Balwani was involved in running the company and in a way that is clearly far beyond the just an investor claim that was made by his defence team in the opening arguments. This was backed up as well by the now regular text messages we see between Holmes and Balwani that the prosecution are using, in my opinion anyway, very successfully. About the volume goals that Theranos was not hitting, Balwani to Holmes. We need to make it a matter of life and death. And Balwani to Holmes again. Survival. We must not lose. Jeffrey Cooper Smith of Oric was then up for the defence. He turned the 40% statistic around and asked if the current amount of Venus draws being done was 40%. Didn't that mean that the majority were being done by finger prick? And that means 60% of the patients were getting finger stick draws, correct? Asked Cooper Smith. Yes responded Javery. Are you aware of any other lab in the world that could have done 60% finger stick draws? No, said Javery. So we saw some more texts between Balwani and Holmes, and these go to the heart of their own approach to the Walgreens contract. It will require a little bit of clarification, uh, but bear with me. Balwani to Holmes. If contract terms and we don't have 1,000 stores, what happens to remaining innovation payment? Holmes to Balwani. If terms because we term, then we return. They term, and we don't want to, we keep. 
So what's happening here when they talk about terms is termination. So they're saying if the contract terminates and who instigates the termination will drive who keeps the innovation payment. In other words, if Walgreens terminates, then Theranos get to keep the innovation payment. And don't forget that was 100 million. And if Theranos terminate the contract, then they have to return it. Balwani to Homes. We don't want 1,000 stores with assholes. Balwani to Homes again. 200 will be enough to prove our point. Balwani to Homes again. I will say we keep 25 no matter what. So clearly we can see the relationship breaking down with Walgreens when Balwani is referring to them as assholes. And they're talking about how many stores to keep with Walgreens, I guess if they could. In my opinion, this would be them wanting to retain some credibility by keeping some stores with Walgreens because of the press that had already taken place in respect to that contract and also with the board as well. Later, we had another exchange of emails that went as follows by to Holmes. Mostly terrible meeting, but net net is what we want. By to Holmes, love you too. By to Holmes. The point about narrowing down menu to hit high FS percentage came to me like a gift of God. By to Holmes, we must hit our volume goals now. And then we had the couple of texts from earlier about it being a matter of life and death and we must not lose. So what's crucial here is Balwani's point about narrowing down the menu to hit high FS percentage. In other words, if they take off the menu of blood tests, all the ones that would require a venous draw, by definition, the percentage of finger stick draws would go up. And so therefore he's talking about manipulating the menus, reducing the offering so that they can only offer finger stick draws. Now the obvious problem with this is that Evidently, someone is going to have to do those Venus draws that Theranos then don't do. And therefore, in reality, there is no reduction in the number of Venus draws. They would need to take place somewhere by somebody. And therefore, it's really just a data manipulation process. So on Wednesday and then on Friday, we got to the testimony of Adam Rosendorf, former lab director. Or rather, we didn't until later in the day on Wednesday, as most of the morning was taken up by the defence, arguing that... Evidence relating to Rosendorf's career after leaving Theranos should be brought into evidence. Rosendorf's evidence in the Holmes trial can be seen here, and I believe he was the witness that was in the stand the longest in that trial. So what was this evidence that the defence wanted to bring in? Well, in a couple of companies that Rosendorf has worked for since Theranos, there have been investigations by the authorities. Now, in particular, the defence brought up that of Ubiome, now that company, somewhat reminiscent of Theranos, had raised millions to undertake microbiome tests from the gut, tests that insurers would pay for. Now apparently they labelled themselves as the 23andMe of poop. Why? I have no idea. But clearly something must have smelled, because ultimately there was an FBI raid and a federal indictment alleging a fraud scheme. The other two companies referred to were firstly Invitae, but there were no documents in that trial relating to the time of Rosendorf's employment, and Perkin Elmer, which had a CMS, that's the Centre for Medicare and Medicaid Services Investigation. Bostick for the prosecution argued that Balwani's team were trying to dirty up Dr. Rosendorf. A point made by Judge de Villa was essentially that the defence was saying that Rosendorf was a bad lab director, and the jury should make a decision on that. Cooper Smith for the defence also made the point that Rosendorf's testimony at the trial in the Theranos case was an attempt to repair his reputation. The issue is this, Dr. Rosendorf, I mean, what are the chances, right? He works at Theranos, and then we've got three other labs where there are varying degrees of issues, said Cooper Smith for the defence. Now, before I get too diverted down a sidetrack into those cases, Judge Tavella eventually ruled that while he could be asked about his work with companies since leaving Theranos, no one could mention the trouble in these companies. After all, Rosendorf himself was not implicated. And Judge Tavella said, he feared that the line of questioning would leave the impression that he, i.e. Rosendorf, was at fault for the investigations. This is pretty much the same ruling that was given in the Holmes trial. So Rosendorf eventually took the stand and first up we had the prosecution and the now familiar line of questioning about when and why he left Theranos. 
Rosendorf testified that this was in December 2014 and it was because he was concerned about the ongoing problems with the company's lab results and importantly to me anyway, the, in quotes, unwillingness of management to conduct proficiency testing to verify the accuracy of the Theranos blood analyzer. I felt like my integrity as a physician was at risk, Rosendorf said. Now the prosecution made numerous additional points with Rosendorf that bolstered their point that Balwani was actively involved in the day-to-day -day running of the company. He wasn't just an investor, he was the ops guy, as one observer put it. Now essentially we're having a cumulative impact here with Mark Pandori and now Adam Rosendorf, both lab directors and both giving credibility to the fact that Balwani was actively involved. After all, every witness that has appeared so far is providing accumulation of evidence that is going on that side of the scale. Under cross-examination, which continued on Friday, he testified that neither CEO Elizabeth Holmes nor COO Ramesh Sunni Balwani ever told him to report an inaccurate blood test result. Now we'll be back next week and I expect the cross-examination of Rosendorf will continue and there is an expectation that we'll see at least one patient take the stand too. One aside, Balwani just sold his house in Atherton. This was a house originally jointly owned by Holmes and Balwani and they'd set up an LLC to purchase it together. This was apparently in an attempt to keep their joint ownership and hence relationship private Anyway, for what it's worth, it cost Balwani approximately $9 million and he sold it a couple of weeks ago for about $16 million. Nice money if you can get it. Well, if you've liked this series so far, then please hit that like button and if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, you won't miss out on any future episodes. Bye for now.